There's a lot of talk about screening tests, and people know that screening is important, but if you look a little closer, screening is actually pretty complicated because a good screening test needs to be certain things, and you can have bad screening tests too. So to, to, for a screening test to be good, for us to care about it, it needs to test for a disease that's common, so you have to find things. Uh, the detection needs to matter, otherwise you're just telling a patient they have something terrible in their life that you can't do anything about, and that's not, you know, if, if you believe the matrix, ignorance is bliss, you don't want to find those cancers. Um, and it needs to be, you know, a good test. You need to actually be specific enough to know what you're finding and sensitive enough to find it in the screening population. So an example of a screening test that's terrible would be a screening test for a brain tumor because our treatments for brain tumors are terrible. And so if you find a brain tumor early, it doesn't really matter. Uh, our intervention early isn't going to help. But that's in contrast to other cancer types like colon cancer where screening is critical and finding it early can interrupt the carcinogenesis pattern and can improve survival. Um, and so if you go through every organ system where you can get cancer, it turns out there's really only six where screening really makes sense. Dr. Parapati touched on one of the most important, which is lung cancer. They also include colon, skin, prostate, cervix, and breast. And I'll just briefly touch on those. Um, colorectal, uh, we have uh, two colorectal surgeons here from Tri-City, um, Dr. Hackman and Dr. Patel. They have a table out there. Go say hi to them. Colorectal surgeons have crazy stories. I'm sure they'd be happy to share them with you. Um, the, the screening test that I'm sure you know is a colonoscopy. It's actually not the only screening test for colorectal cancer. You can also do less invasive tests called a fecal, a blood, a fecal occult blood test where you take a stool sample and you smear it on a little card and it'll tell you if you have blood in your stool, um, which will then prompt a colonoscopy. Uh, or you can have a special type of a CT scan that will digitize the lining of the colon to look for polyps, and if they find that, you get a colonoscopy. So all roads lead to colonoscopy with colorectal cancer and with screening. You kind of end up there in any case. But for some patients, it can make sense to do these kind of least less invasive steps first. And it's been estimated that if everyone would do the screening as recommended, we could avoid 50% of colorectal cancer deaths, which is huge for a cancer that accounts for the second most common cause of cancer death, the first being, as you just learned, lung cancer. So it's kind of an icky test and people don't like it and they don't want to think about it, but it's hugely important. Colorectal cancer, I'll just touch on this uh, very briefly. Age is a uh, risk uh, for any kind of cancer that isn't a pediatric cancer, so every slide will say age first. Um, and diet is one that has a big influence on colorectal cancer and it's basically avoid eating things that you like to eat. Um, and so if you like to eat it, it's not good for you and if you don't like it, then it's probably good for you. Smoking is also a risk factor for colorectal. In fact, we talked about smoking in relation to lung cancer, but it's hugely important in pretty much every cancer type. So you do yourself a huge favor or a friend a huge favor if you can quit or encourage them to quit. This is a colon. It's actually a rectum. Um, I'm glad you already ate. Uh, this is a surgical specimen of some, an unfortunate person who had colorectal cancer. It's a, this is a super famous slide, actually. I bet every medical student in the country has seen this photo. So whoever this patient was did medicine a great service. And the reason it's so awesome, or terrible, is because you can actually see every step of colorectal cancer progression in this specimen. So here, on this area, you can see that the mucosa, or the, the surface of the colon is nice and smooth, it looks regular, this is normal rectum. As you come over here, you can start to see these little polyps. That's the first step in carcinogenesis and colorectal cancer. Here you can see a big polyp. This is a tubulobilis polyp. This is a precancerous lesion. When you get a colonoscopy, your doctor can see this, and then they can clip it and take it out of your body. So not only do they detect it early, they can also interrupt the process of cancer growing. Unfortunately, this person did not have that interrupted, and this is an invasive cancer that is now eaten through the basement membrane, and you can see everything's kind of scarring down and puckering down, which is why this person had to have their rectum out, um, because this is the invasive cancer. So in just one picture, you can see how colorectal cancer marches to invasion. And it's a unique cancer, but not every cancer does that. Some cancers show up like spontaneously, really late, but colorectal doesn't. It follows this very ordered progression, which is why screening is so effective and so important. This is it in cartoon form. You can see it going from left to right, an abnormal growth that eventually becomes invasive. It's not a fast process, 
in normal people who have an immune system that works, um, it probably takes 10 years, which gives you time to intervene. And happily, it means you only have to have a scope every 10 years. I mentioned there are other tests, but they're pretty terrible. You just need a colonoscopy. Um, and this is what the physician actually sees. So this is a great example of the exam of someone who actually did their prep, uh, which is the junk you drink beforehand to empty out. Uh, the test itself actually isn't that bad. They knock you out with propofol, um, which killed Michael Jackson. But they give it carefully, <laughs> and you wake up. Uh, but during it, like the test is fine. It's the night before when you're on the toilet all night. Um, but it's worth it, because a great prep lets your doctor see that. And 10 years from now, that little lump would have killed this patient, almost certainly. And the screening guidelines, unless you have a family history, most cancer groups recommend starting at about 45. Uh, it used to be 50, but they lowered the age. Um, so I think I'm 10 years from that. So if you're 10 years older than me, um, you get to start. And I get to be there in a decade, so that'll be great. Can't wait. So skin cancer. Uh, skin cancer is actually the most common cancer. It's often excluded from those statistics because it's crazy common, especially uh, cancers that aren't so scary like squamous cell cancer or basal cell cancers. Those are like a cosmetic annoyance in most cases. But it also includes melanoma, and melanoma is a terrifying disease when you see a lot of it. Um, the reason that there are three types is because your skin has three main layers. There's the top layer, which is the um, the squamous cells, they become squamous cell carcinoma. Under that is where the new stem cells are regenerating, that's the basal layer, that's where basilar cancer comes from. And then the pigmented cells are the melanocytes and that's where melanoma comes from. Melanoma uh, is something that nobody should get, but a ton of people do. Um, and you can help yourself by being vigilant and paying attention to your skin, and your partner can help you too by paying attention because and not in every case, but in most cases, you see a similar progression with melanoma that you do with colon cancer. And the moles look pretty weird. So if you keep an eye on your skin and you start seeing weird moles, um, you know, ignorance is not bliss. Go to a dermatologist and get it checked out. It's super easy to get a biopsy. Um, and it can be hugely important because like colon cancer, an early stage melanoma is extremely curable and a late stage melanoma is a nightmare. So it's worth paying attention. And you should also know that it doesn't just show up on your skin. Anywhere in your body that has pigment can get melanoma. So the fingernail, um, this is called a subungual melanoma. It's actually very common in Americans with African ancestry. You can get it in your eye, on your iris or on the back of your eye. Um, women can get it on the inside of the vagina. We can all get it in our throats or in our rectum. So those are places that aren't gonna be commonly examined and noticed, but if you notice weird bleeding or weird pain, like, don't be afraid of your doctor and go and tell them and let them know so that they can take a look and figure it out. But melanoma, while it starts in pigmented areas of the body, has an incredible tendency to spread. Um, this is Kevin Malone in the office. Uh, and Michael asked him what the best medicine was. And he said his doctor replied a combination of interferon and decarbazine, which I think is one of the funniest lines of the office, but I, that's because I'm like a cancer doctor and kind of a nerd. Um, but you don't want that. You don't want interferon and you don't want decarbazine or any of the other medicines that we get for melanoma these days. These are the risk factors. I was putting this slide together. I have every one of these, so that's a little alarming. Um, living in Arizona is actually an independent risk factor to developing melanoma, being in Arizona and being in Australia. So congratulations, you all have one of these on this list. Uh, UV exposure, working not in an office, so that applies to a lot of people here. Um, and then having fair skin, freckles, uh, peeling sunburn at a young age. So if you ever went to Lake Roosevelt or Lake Powell and you had a bur bad burn, um, that's not good. Having over 100 moles, that's people like me, mole man, and having a family history. Also, if you have a family history of other cancers, including uterine cancer, uh, prostate cancer, or brain cancer, there are certain genetic alterations that also predispose you to melanoma. So be aware of your family history and talk to your family. They um, probably want to talk to you in most cases. Um, there are other special reasons that you can develop cancers of any type. One special case is immune suppression. So folks who are on medicines for autoimmune disorders, and if you have one, you'd know you're on it. There are medicines like infliximab um, and Embril. Um, you should be aware that you're at higher risk of developing malignancy of any type due to how the immune system surveils and regulates 
the development of cancer. Um, and interestingly, melanoma has a weird gender predilection that depends on age. So if you're younger than 50, women are at high risk, and beyond that, it flips to men, which is, I just put this on here so you could impress your friends with some trivia. Um, age is on here again, we already talked about that. And then these are the ABCDs, so this is what you wanna look for. Asymmetry, so if one half doesn't look like the other, border irregularity, I'm not sure how that's different than asymmetry, but if you don't have it, it doesn't say A, B, C, D. C is color, so if it's not uniform or has weird colors, that's not good. And then D is diameter. Anything bigger than the eraser on a pencil is something that you should keep an eye on. And then adding to that, if anything ever changes, so if a mole looked like this you know, in an old photograph and doesn't now, have somebody look at it. And these are just some examples of what normal looks like and what scary looks like. And the reason you want to find it early is so that this doesn't happen. Uh, melanoma loves to go to the brain. And when it goes to the brain, it causes big issues. And you end up in my office, and you, you don't want to see me um, in the clinic. Because if you're seeing me, you've got a problem. And so this is why screening is so important, because you can avoid this by, by keeping an eye on what's going on on your skin so that it doesn't go somewhere else. Uh, this is a photograph of an old Grecian doctor who probably has prevented more cancer than any other person in the world. And his name is Papa Nicolaou, which if it sounds vaguely familiar, it's because he is the doctor who invented the pap test. Um, I'm sure many of you know that the pap test is a screening test for cervical cancer. It's actually the name of a, uh, of a dye that's used to stain cells. It's used in more screening than just cervical cancer, but cervical cancer has made a huge splash because it's cheap and it's pretty effective at finding cervical cancer early. Cervical cancer is a huge problem in the world for uh, women with cancer death. It's, if you look at a world sample, it's as least as concerning as breast cancer. And the reason is because many women don't have access to get pap smears and to get pelvic exams. This test has dramatically changed the presentation of cervical cancer, which used to be the number three cancer killer in the United States, and now is like number 20, uh, because it's so effective. It's critical for any female. Uh, so if you are a female, or if you're related to a female, um, it should matter to you and to your life. Um, Cervical cancer starts in an area called the transitional zone of the cervix, which is a transition in the type of cell between the vagina and the uterus. And in almost every case, the reason that it starts is because of the HPV virus. HPV is human papillomavirus. It is a virus that is everywhere. Like probably 90% of the people in this room have been exposed to HPV. Most of us are able to clear it with our immune system, but not everybody. And if your immune system doesn't clear it, it stays and replicates in the cells, usually of either the cervix or in men, of the head and neck. And over many years, it produces a protein that shuts down a gene that looks for cancerous cells in your body. And so it allows cells to acquire mutations and to turn into cancer. Now, HPV also causes genital warts. Um, and so for many years, it was considered just to be an annoyance, like it caused genital warts, that's a bummer, whatever. Um, we don't need to worry about that. We're all very upstanding citizens. We don't have those. Um, and then they did epidemiological studies and they saw that while some strains of HPV cause genital warts, there are others, specifically strains 16 and 18, that have a hugely increased risk for developing cancer. And because of where these cancers develop, um, you often don't know about them until they're fairly advanced. The main risk for getting cervical cancer is not seeing an OBGYN and getting screened. There's other uh, you know, risk factors like smoking or having a weakened immune system, but just not getting screened is the, biggest, is the biggest reason. So every woman, whether or not they're sexually active or how many partners they've had or anything, should get screened at 21. And then there are recommendations beyond that depending on what's seen at the time of the screening. Happily, you don't have to do it forever. Um, once a woman is old enough and has had enough clear paths, they can kind of taper off because they're not at such high risk. It's not just women. HPV causes many cancers. The slide on the top right is what I do all day. That is a penis with needles through it. Uh, that's a technique called brachytherapy, which is used for penile preservation and penile cancer. 
If you don't want to have this done, you can have the penis surgically removed entirely. Um, so many men prefer this. This cancer is caused by HPV. The gentleman on the bottom right has a tonsillar tumor. Tonsillar head and neck cancers back in like the 50s and 60s were almost entirely caused by excess alcohol and smoking. But in the last five years, it switched to where most cases of cancers of the tonsil, base of tongue, and pharynx are caused by the HPV virus. And it has, it has switched, so it's actually not so associated with alcohol and smoking anymore. And the reason why I'm talking about this a lot is because there is a vaccine for this. There is an anti-cancer vaccine. You hear a lot on the news about uh, them trying to develop vaccines for like glioblastoma, which is the kind of brain tumor that John McCain died of, and these other really scary cancers. We have one for like six common cancers caused by HPV. Um, the current vaccine is called, called Gardasil 9. It protects against nine serotypes of HPV, including 16 and 18, which are the most common for causing cancer. There's also 31 and 35, which are two other strains associated with cancer. And it covers uh, three additional that cover genital warts. So you get a two for one. It's an anti-cancer vaccine and it protects from warts. Initially, it was rolled out for young women to be vaccinated which was actually kind of a terrible thing to do because parents were really nervous about giving their daughters this vaccine with, that was associated with a, a, you know, a virus that can be transmitted sexually. People didn't want to do it. Um, they should have vaccinated their young men because dads tend not to care about their young men as much and they're willing to vaccinate them more. And because it's actually men who have a harder time clearing the HPV infection than women. So the human reservoir for HPV, giving it to each other, is actually men. Um, it's now approved for men and women, and where initially it was encouraged to give prior to sexual activity, starting, starting at age 11, it's so effective and so safe that last year the FDA approved it for up to age 45. So if you're younger than 45 and you haven't been vaccinated for HPV, you can be vaccinated. It usually makes the most sense in people age 26 and younger, but given that it's so effective and so safe, I would encourage you to consider it if you haven't been vaccinated, even if you're older than that. The current way that the virus is made, it's not a live attenuated virus like the polio virus where they actually take the virus, weaken it and inject it. It's just proteins that mimic the HPV um, antigens on the cell, which are uh, grown inside of a, a bacteria using a plasmid. So it actually never even was a part of an HPV virus. It just is a target for your immune system to learn. So if it ever sees the HPV virus, it'll be ready to kill it. And it's super safe and highly effective with over 90% of patients not developing infection despite being exposed if they've had this vaccine. So like of everything we talked about tonight, the three most important things are probably get a colonoscopy, quit smoking, and get vaccinated for HPV. Those are the three biggest things you can do to prevent cancer in your life. There are other good things too, but those are huge. Uh, breast cancer, um, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer is the second most common cause of cancer in women. The first being skin cancer, like you all know now. Um, and breast cancer also is one of those cancers that when detected early has much lower mortality than when detected late, which is why you see pink ribbons everywhere. They're encouraging you to get a mammogram or to encourage your spouse or your sister or your mom to get a mammogram. And the reason is because of the biggest risk factor for getting breast cancer is being female, uh, which isn't actually the only case. About 1% of breast cancers are seen in men. Uh, so if you are a gentleman and you notice something strange on the surface of your chest, bring that to the attention of your doctor because you can get breast cancer. There are famous genetic risk factors like the BRCA1 and 2 genes that Angelina Jolie had um, that a, incur a huge risk for breast cancer, but 90% are never found to be associated with a genetic link. So even if no one in your family's ever had it, it's important uh, to consider to can, um, encourage your partner to be screened. Um, there's a bunch of other risk factors, but the, you know, I'm going too long. So a mammogram, it's a, it's a pretty easy thing to do. It's not super enjoyable, but it's better than a colonoscopy. Um, they <laughs> push the breast between two plates and, and then they take x-ray images. Those are interpreted, and then if there's anything you know, abnormal, the radiologist will encourage a biopsy at that time. Clinical breast exam, it's basically know your lumps and bumps. Um, you shouldn't be ignorant of your body in general, and certainly not your breasts. Uh, many women self-palpate the nodule that brings their cancer to the attention of their doctor. 
And then uh, this is kind of in the weeds for more medical students, I'll skip that. Um, but basically starting at age 45-ish, younger, if you have a strong family history, you should consider talking to your doctor about starting mammograms. And then uh, the last one is prostate cancer, so men don't get a free ride either. Um, prostate cancer is super common in men. One in eight men will be diagnosed over their lifetime. If you live old enough and get an autopsy, it's probably more like three out of four if you live to the age of 80. It's just most people don't get an autopsy when they die of something else. Um, some amount of cancer is probably just a normal part of aging with men, but once in a while, a prostate cancer will appear that is super aggressive and becomes a big problem. Um, you know, the, the prostate itself is a gland that sits between the, the bladder and the penile bulb. It has, um, the joke is it has three functions. Uh, during embryogenesis, it helps the male reproductive system develop. During your childbearing years, it helps produce semen. And when you're past your childbearing years, it helps urologists collect an income. <laughs> so it really doesn't do anything once you're done having kids. Uh, but it causes a lot of problems. And this is one of them. Uh, when, ca when prostate cancer presents late, you can see the image on the right, which is a bone scan. Each one of those little black dots is an area of bone that is furiously trying to remodel because it's being eaten by prostate cancer. And bone is where prostate cancer goes, invariably, as its first step. It can eventually go to other places, but it always goes to the bone if not addressed. If a man's diagnosed late enough in life, perhaps they don't have to do anything about it because they're going to die of something else first. Um, but if they're diagnosed younger, and I've seen patients as young as mid-40s get diagnosed with prostate cancer, then it becomes a big problem that needs to be managed. So because of that, um, a screening test was developed, and the screening test is the PSA, which actually has a pretty weird history. Um, for, for years, there was no screening test for PSA other than a digital rectal exam, so having a finger in the bum, which doesn't work very well, as you might imagine. Um, then the PSA test was introduced in the 80s, and the number of early stage cancers that were detected went through the roof. So instead of presenting late with bone mats, uh, for which the treatment is castration, men were presenting earlier, where they could get non-castration treatments like radiation or surgery. Then uh, the U.S. Preventative Task Force Services looked at how many men's lives were saved by doing early intervention, and it turns out that castration works pretty well. So once cancer is detected, you can keep a man alive, even though they're riddled with prostate cancer, for a long time by castrating them. So the screening test didn't prevent death. As a result, the task force recommended not screening PSA back in 2012. Then over the last five years, there's been a huge change in the stage that men present with cancer. So instead of presenting early, they started presenting late again. And so more and more men showed up with bone mets, and although we kept them alive with our fancy castration medicines, being castrated is kind of unpleasant. And so they went back and looked at the data and saw that while PSA screening doesn't necessarily influence death from prostate cancer, it lets men keep their testicles or their testicular function. And so the, the US Preventive Task Force Services actually stepped back and they said, oops, we made a mistake, you should probably screen again. So the current recommendation from the uh, American Neurologic Association is to start at age 45 to get a baseline. If it's less than three, you're done for the next 10 years. Uh, between ages of 60 and 70, again, you should get screened. And if after the age of 60, your PSA is less than one, you don't have to be screened again. But if your PSA is higher than three and you're young, or if it's between one and two and it's going up, you should follow it and you just get it checked every year, and if it does something surprising, you can pull the trigger then to look into it further, and then you find it early, and you have much more management options than losing your testosterone. And that's it, now you know everything about cancer. So the impact of smoking on cancer is related to chronic inflammation. Uh, chronic inflammation is a common initiating step in carcinogenesis, it turns on cell signals, for cells to start dividing again to defend themselves. And every time a cell divides, it can acquire a mutation that will tell it to keep on dividing forever and ever. So like pure nicotine, if you were just like getting infusional nicotine, that probably doesn't increase your cancer risk. It's not so much the nicotine itself, it's all the other crap that you're inhaling into your lungs that's causing an inflammatory response in your lungs and is causing your lung cells and the other cells in your body to try to defend themselves by starting to, to reproduce more quickly. And every time, 
You know, it's, it's like winning the lottery. The chance of getting a, a, a cancer cell is like one in a trillion. But if you have a trillion cells in your body and they're all you know, dividing once a year, suddenly your odds start looking like not zero. Yeah, that's a good point. Chew, chew, so uh, smokeless tobacco replacement is often encouraged to decrease the risk of lung cancer, which it does, but it carries with it the risk of uh, cancers of the oral cavity and the oropharynx and the esophagus, um, which are also pretty bad to get. So even cutting down is useful. Um, I think I get like a demerit from the medical board if I don't say quit, but even if you can just like decrease, that's somewhere to start. And keep in mind, like most people, it takes nine times to quit. So if you've tried once before and you've failed, it doesn't mean you're a failure, it just means you're like, you've started the trip to Mordor and you'll get there in the end, but this was a long movie <laughs> and it had some extra scenes, so be patient. <laughs>